everyone and welcome back to the 2021 Spring Outdoor Adventure Expo. Um, today at, we are going to be listening to a presentation from Bob O'Hara who's going to be talking about um, paddling the far north of Canada and Alaska from 1967 to 2017. And we've been chatting a little bit um, before the presentation started and I think it's going to be an absolutely awesome presentation. So if you are joined on to the chat, or if you're on the Outdoor Adventure Expo website, feel free to join the chat, and you can type your questions right into that box, and Bob will be able to answer them throughout his presentation. Um, yeah, great. I'm going to pass it over to you, Bob, and you can take it away. Thank you. Well, I can't see anybody, but I guess you can see me. And I'm gonna, I have three programs for Midwest. This today is, is some trips in the North. And on Saturday at two o'clock, it'll be my 63rd consecutive year in the Boundary Waters. I'm doing a Boundary Waters program from the early fifties to all the way up to modern times. And then on Sunday, I'm doing a trip on the Central Arctic Rivers and expedition planning. And that's at 12 o'clock. So if you have interest in those, you can jot those down. So my key term here is discovery of the outdoors. And I think the word is discovery because that's what we do in every trip. That's what we do on, on our everyday life. And the excitement of discovery is there's something new around the corner. So each outdoor event is a new discovery. You often can repeat a given area through the season. So if you're doing the boundary waters and I repeat it when I go back and do another far north trip. You like diversity to find a new challenge. That's always great. And you improve your gear to enhance your growing experience. We all start out with inexpensive gear, old gear, hand-me-down gear. And as modern technology comes along, you simply take advantage of it if it works for you. So how do you know where you're going to go? So I put out this canoe, and this person here doesn't know where to go for their daily walk. So they flip a coin, heads clockwise or other ways counterclockwise. I hope you do a better job than that if you're going to the far north. We're not flipping coins. We're doing our discovery to find out what we need, where to go, how to do it. So discovery presents lots of challenges to us. And I've outlined some of those in the far north. Rain and wind, they are there, they are real, and you have to plan. Otherwise, you're going to have issues. Cold and hot, both can happen. We've had days of 90 some in, in the Arctic. We've had a lot of days down in the freezing cold temperatures and you have to dress accordingly. Bugs are part of the Arctic. They're part of the ecosystem. Ice is still there, but climate change will eventually change that, but there is still ice. Portages are actually somewhat rare, but they do occur. And you have a long daylight. And for part of the summer, you have virtually 24 hour daylight. All of that happens in one day. So these are things I've collected over time. No such thing as a free lunch. And in the Arctic, there are no free lunches at all. The closest thing you have to a free lunch would be a sunny day with no wind and no bugs. But other than that, you have to work for everything you get. Okay, I found that common sense is my total fallback. I don't know where we learn common sense. I think it's innate for us, but we learned it as little kids without even realizing we were learning common sense. The KISS principle, you've all used that one, keep it simple, stupid, don't, over, <clears throat> don't overwork things, keep them simple, don't overthink things. And in your planning, make sure all your gear kind of follows that keep it, <clears throat> keep it simple principle. The one I invented myself is if you really want to rough it, you put sandpaper and seat of your pants. We do not go into the outdoors, we do not do discovery because we're looking for punishment because we're looking to be put in a tough situation. We're going there to discover and to enjoy, and you don't make it any more difficult than necessary. But the single thing that, count, that counts the most, and we forget this living in the house, is nature bats last. So when it gets windy, you go in the house. When it gets rainy, you go in the house. When it gets buggy, you go in the house. When you're out on a canoe trip, there is no house. And so you have to plan for nature bats last, and your preparation will make it work. So how did I get started doing this? Well, I had very, very nice parents who as a little kid let me put a big sheet or bedspread over the clothesline. We had them in those days and I would sleep there overnight. 
and I'm sure they would check on me periodically, but I love camping and I started as a really young kid. Eventually I grew up into Boy Scout camping and we camped all the time. And in the mid fifties, I was introduced to my first canoe ever at scout camp. And that followed with my first ever Boundary Water canoe trip right after high school graduation, because I've been reading Sig Olson. I never heard of Ely. I'd never heard about the Boreal Forest. And I went up and discovered it. By accident, I ended up on a trip to Hudson Bay in 1967, when one of the people in our group found a, a copy of the Canoeing with the Cree by Eric Severide, which was out of print in those days. Now it's been reprinted. And so we went there and I thought, well, that'd be my one big trip of my life. Little did I know that I had discovered the far north. There was so much further north of, of where we were in Hudson Bay and that I started my, uh, my tripping. But it, in those days with no internet, it took us two years to find our way to the Thelon River. So this is what we look like in 59. Now realize there's no Gore-Tex, there's no synthetics, there's no great anything. Look at our wonderful hats. We've all gotten cotton clothes on. One guy's got his leather jacket. And so we had uh, homemade tents. They had no floors, no bug netting, all cotton clothes. We wore no life jackets in those days. We rented from the outfitter. I can tell you one thing that metal cups burn your lips and metal plates make your food get cold really fast. And we slip right on the ground. And amazingly, we all survived. So here's the canoe. That's our, our, our choice for traveling. Oops, that went too fast. I'm gonna go back and get that back. Sorry. So there's all kinds of canoes and they all have different purposes. So on the right hand column, the canoe on the top is a canoe with covers made for far north travel. Okay, and that happens to be a discovery canoe because that's all I could afford. And I would have liked a tripper, but I couldn't afford them at $1,000 a boat. The middle one is not mine, but it's a play boat and it's made for whitewater canoeing. And it's, you can put bags in there to, and you got a, a saddle you sit on and you're just going out to tumble around. Today, most people replace that with a kayak. On the bottom are two 18 foot Grumman's and that's the start of the back river in 1973 of which we obviously didn't paddle. We did some dragging and walking before we got in the water. And the far left is the Hood River. And we went late, we went late July, but it was a huge ice year and the headwater lake was frozen. Pilot found a place to stick us in and we worked, got our way to the hood. And we paddled until we see that clear blue in the top. And from there it was free sailing all the way to the Arctic Ocean. So the size and shape of your canoe is based on what you need it for and what you do it. If you notice, my canoes look pregnant because we have to stand the packs up because we're out for so long. If you're on a short trip, you can lay your packs down and they don't come above the gunnels. So birch bark is the original. And a lot of my friends have paddled birch bark a lot of different places, but they've never paddled them in the Arctic because they didn't have any birch bark in the Arctic. So the Inuit used skin boats. So here's a wood canvas. When I grew up as a kid, that's all there was. There wasn't the Grumman Canoe Company yet. The Grumman started making canoes after World War II. Before that, they were making airplanes. And the canoes I paddled in didn't have any seats. They had just thwarts and you knelt down. And all the native people knelt down. Seats are a more modern kind of way. These canoes are still excellent canoes. They work extremely well. And they're a little on the pricey side, but you can find them. So here's two different shapes for two different purposes. The canoe on the bottom is made for the boundary waters. It's long, it's sleek, it goes really, really straight. So novice paddlers don't have much problem keeping it straight. Boundary waters doesn't really have much for rivers and they don't have any white water, okay? So these boats don't turn very well in the river. If you want a river canoe, you take the one on the top, it's a little wider, it's got more stability, it can carry more weight, and it has rocker so that you can easily steer it around rocks. Here was a hybrid, I don't think it ever worked out. It was a combination canoe kayak. It was bigger, bigger cockpits. So putting packs in for like the boundary waters and obviously it's the solo boat and it was called a Kanak. You don't see those anymore today. So here's my modern solo boat. 
And because I don't, if I, I don't think I'll ever tip over, but should I tip over, I don't want to go swimming for packs. So I simply make sure that they stay in. In on lakes, I use a double bladed paddle, which allows me to paddle as faster, faster than some people in tandem boats. The one drawback on a solo boat like this, and you can see the portage yokes pads in behind the seat, is that you have to sit back from where the portage yoke would be and you can't have a yoke there. So you have to put it on and take it off every time. They do make some portage yokes that hook on to the back of your seat and you just pull them down. Here's one of my expedition boats. This is my favorite. Believe it or not, this is a Kevlar. And it doesn't weigh 30 some pounds, it weighs 65 pounds. It's a heavily reinforced Kevlar made for far North Arctic rivers. You can bounce it off the rocks. Notice the pregnancy in the middle. That's all our packs standing upright with the heavier part of the packs below the gunnel. The flag is the flag of Nunavut. Nunavut is the new territory that was created when they split the Northwest Territories into different parts. This is the Eastern part of the old Northwest Territories. It was formed in 1999. It's basically Inuit people Northwest Territories was mostly native uh, Indian people. The word Tuktu means caribou. All of my canoes get an Inuit animal name. So Tuktu is caribou, Amaruk is wolf, uh, Umingmuk is muskox, Nanook is uh, polar bears, Siksik is a ground squirrel. I started with aluminum canoes and they work well. I got my first one in 1969. I had it till 95 until my neighbor stole it, so that's life. And we've used 17 foot, 18 foot, and 20 foot. There's an 18 foot Grumman, early expeditions. We didn't have covers except for the front, the Velcro on the front is where the guy can snap a cover on during whitewater. And why we threw a tarp over that, I'm not sure, but we did. And I'm sitting in the back. I went on the Soper River in Baffin Island and we had to get it stuff from an outfitter and these are soar craft. They're used a lot in the mountains and especially the small streams. They're very narrow. They're inflated inner tube is what they are, inflated bottom. You have barrels that are just wide enough or just that can fit in the, the boat is just wide enough to fit a barrel and the seats are terrible. But notice you can run over ledges like crazy. They don't do well in wind, obviously, and they don't, don't do well in the headwind at all. Here's one of my favorites. I got these in 2005 when I wanted to do a river going to Pelly Bay on the Arctic Ocean. The settlement's now called Kugaruk, and the only way in was a plane that had wheels that could land on the tundra. There were no float planes available, and so I bought pack boats, and the original pack boat concept was alley craft over in Norway, and a Norwegian guy came over here in the U.S. and he made his pack boat. And so all the long poles you see are shock corded, just like a tent. And he's looking the upper right. You can see the uh, preformed ribs that are there. And you can see us putting it together. And a, a boat that's completely done is on the left. And the black things are an addition. They're floorboards. I'll talk about those later. Um, the one terminology piece I thought interesting, if you look on the bottom right, the gunnels come together at each end and they have to be attached. And there's a U-shaped piece of metal. It's called a gunnel terminator. And you slide those two together and you have a rigid boat. Without that, you don't have rigidity. And here's the problem with the gunnel terminator. It can easily fall out of the pack when you're traveling. So I would strap mine to the seats so they wouldn't fall out. And I carried an extra one with, with me all the time just to have. So here we're putting our pack boats together and you can see one's already formed and we're sitting on the tundra. We're, we're way above the Arctic Circle and you can see there's snow still out there. That'll be there most of the year. And we are in late July and you can see how we're dressed. It's a cool day for wind. You can see our tarp up that we'll cook under That'll eventually get replaced on future trips with a, a more enclosed shelter called a lean three. So here's the Colville River. Still that snow is still there. This is uh, 
very further north of where we were. This is in Alaska. This goes to the Arctic Ocean, 400 and some miles. And we flew in with small planes and we took two planes to get us in. And the difference between the two boats is red is the single most fadable color. And so the red one is faded because of that really intense Arctic light and the other one is brand new. And again, you can see how the cover works in the middle. The packs stand up, it's like a sled dog cover and you pull the, the, the cover up and fold it over and you put the straps on and it works really well and it keeps everything bone dry. This is why we wear covers. This is the Bailey River, a fun little river. It's not very big. And if this were a husband wife team, <clears throat> the wife has wet underwear and wet pants. And more than likely the guy in the back took very little if any water whatsoever. And so the bow person always is going to be the most uncomfortable because you're always getting wet. And that's the purpose of putting a cover on. You stay dry. So here's my, here's my ski now. This is my Arctic boat. And I took it on the Boundary Waters on my 50th anniversary to give it a test. And I found out one thing, it's not a lake boat. It's a river boat. You have a hard time on a side one keeping it straight. But I'd like to point out here how everybody's different. Notice the lady on the left doesn't mind bugs and doesn't have much on. The lady on the right has everything on, including her bug net. So Colville River, this is what's called learning by experience. Again, a discovery issue. I wanted to get the most out of the Colville River. So I went as close as I could to the source. And little did I know, because I had no information. If you look below that snowbank, it's all black dirt. And as the snowbank melts, it all comes in the river. And if you look at the river, it's not clear, it is muddy. If we would have waited two or three weeks, we would have to fly in probably an additional 40 or 50 miles to get deep enough water, but the water would have been crystal clear. And that's just part of learning. The, uh, the solar panel you see behind the bowman, I'll talk about that later. I carry those for lots of reasons. So now you've got to get your canoe someplace. And so my budget fit the Volkswagens and a Volkswagen van was simply a box on wheels. And you sat right on top of your bumper and you learned to drive defensively. And I'm taking two 20 foot canoes up to Thompson, Manitoba. You can see the painted names on there for the canoes. And we're gonna give them, take, put them on a train and take them to Churchill. And we're going to put them on a barge and send them to Baker Lake. And we're going to use them the next summer. That's the kind of planning I've had to go through. The ones in the middle was simply we're driving up to Yellowknife or to Thompson, wherever the trip is, with canoe, two canoes we're taking up for that trip. And on the bottom, notice there's no canoes on the roof. And there's three pack boats in those black bags on the bottom. And so they travel very easily. And we've flown from Minneapolis Airport all the way to Kotzebue, Alaska, with all of our gear, including boats, 12 packs for four people, three apiece. It's an amazing. Going up to Thompson to get the train to do the Deer River, we met some guys from Illinois, and they had three canoes, which is very imaginative, on top of their boat. They're all solo boats. And if we were over in Europe, that would be illegal. You cannot extend beyond the width of your vehicle in Europe. So going to Yellowknife, which I've been many, many times, it's a 51-hour uh, drive or so from Minneapolis. Usually I take five or six days. One year I got behind schedule, did the whole thing in three days, 17 hours a day. But the McKinsey River is a mile wide below its um, outlet on, on Great Slave Lake. And there was a free ferry in around 18 hours a day. That's now been replaced with a bridge and the ferry now is extinct. I rode that ferry a lot. I've ridden trains a lot, either to Churchill coming and going, or from Thompson going up and catching a river that we could paddle. So here we are, the train dropped us off. This is our hard shell boats. We're putting our covers on and we are going to go over to the river, pull through the brush, and we're gonna paddle to Churchill. And it's a nice little route, doesn't take long inexpensive. It's not the, not the Arctic. It's the very, very top of the taiga. And here we are in June. So in the Boundary Waters, the snow would have been gone by 
late April, early May. Here we are mid-June in Churchill, on the way to Churchill. And you can see that not only is there a lot of snow, but none of the trees have leafed out yet, which also meant no bugs. This is a different trip. This is a trip that uh, we had to go to Churchill to pick up our companions and they'd already put their boat together. And our companions are uh, park service people for Canada because we got a permit to go down the Owl River through the Wapusik National Park, which was made for the polar bear denning. And there are like all parks, there are a zillion rules and regs. And they sent two rangers with us claiming they wanted to look at the area, but I think they were there to spy on us. Wonderful people. And we paddled that to Hudson Bay. And then the only way out was a helicopter, which is why the pack boats work, because you can pick them up and put them back in a helicopter. And this was one of the rangers. And we, we didn't need covers on this trip. It's a small river, fun river. So I've been going to Alaska the last few years because uh, I've done so many rivers in Canada. I was running out of the Central Arctic rivers. And the other is because of cost. So we can fly all of our gear from Minneapolis to Anchorage and Anchorage to Katsubu. And you walk next door to the main uh, terminal, which is a small building, and you pick up this nice little Cessna. It's like having a Beetle Volkswagen with wings. And you can put in a pilot, co-pilot, and another person. And the two people with our weight and our gear were allowed 900 pounds. We had no problem for a two-week trip. Notice our pack boat is the black bag. The other bags are there on the far left are our day packs. And in the uh, yellow bag is my CPAP. And that's why I carry a uh, solar panel because I discovered in 2000 that I had severe sleep apnea. I stopped breathing 72 times an hour. Had been that way for a number of years, the doctor said, and had absolutely no REM sleep. And three days on CPAP, I thought I was 15 years old. And I'm 80 currently, and I'm still going strong. And I use that every single day whether I'm in the Arctic, in the Boundary Waters, or wherever. And that little river we're paddling is what you see in the back. It's called the Kokolik. It's not very big, but it's really an interesting experience. To get there, we don't fly over the Brooks Range. We fly through the passes. Wonderful. Alaska has great opportunities. So here's a 20-foot canoe on a beaver. This is one of those canoes that we took up to Churchill and shipped to Baker Lake. And a beaver is the absolute workhorse of all bush planes and all the fishing lodges have these beavers. And we put this 20 footer on and put our gear in and we flew up to Wager Bay and Hudson Bay and then we paddled all the way to Repulse. This is a um, single otter on floats. This is the first trip of the Coich River. We're the first to go down it. And it took two flights to get here. And when you have to have separate flights, everybody going in has to be 100% self-contained. So they have to have the food, the cooking equipment, the tents, the paddles, everything. If the other people never fly in for whatever reason, then these people have to start their trip and get out. If you notice, there's some ice in the background. Here's that same plane at Baker Lake. And notice that there are wheels on the bottom of the floats because this plane runs down the runway and then lands in the water. And when it comes back, having left the lake, it lands on the wheels. Just so happens that on this trip, after the pilot got everybody back to the original group, and we're all at Snowdrift Lake, we're gonna head down to the uh, Hudson Bay area. The pilot flying out, the motor stopped, he glided into a pond, another plane came and picked him up, they flew out, he got parts for the plane, they flew him back, and he fixed it in the pond and flew out. So these bush pilots are amazing guys. Here's my favorite plane, it's the Twin Otter. We call it the Workhorse of the North. It'll hold 18 people. But for us, it'll hold three canoes and six people, and it can fly virtually anywhere and land on not too much space. It's called a stole aircraft, short takeoff and landing. We've always flown three canoes. These small places have been consolidated to a larger company and the lawyers sitting somewhere in Toronto or Montreal or Ottawa, looking at specs and pieces of paper, never having flown this airplane, never had an accident, never had any problem, decided three canoes was not legal. So we quit doing that. That's what also brought the pack boats. 
So here we are unloading our twin otter. I've also flown helicopters and uh, they work and they're fun. It's like being in a bubble, you can really see the land. And we were in Baker Lake and the plane to fly us in was totally booked and they had overbooked us. And there was some mining activity going on. We had to go 40 miles to get to Princess Mary and a helicopter guy said he'd take us over. Notice Princess Mary is frozen. It's not supposed to be frozen and glad we had the helicopter. So a trip that's not, it's not far north, but it's in a Nordic country is we had a chance to paddle across the entire country of Finland from the Amatra border with Russia, town of Amatra, over to the Baltic Sea, which is the division between Sweden and Finland. It was all lakes to start with, like the boundary waters. Then it was all streams and eventually big rivers and dams. We met a guy partway through who gave us his portage wheels to go around dams, and that really helped us a lot. And that's the Finnish flag you see there. So ice is a canoeist nightmare. It's the worst thing, and you can't predict it. Every year it's different. People from the Y camps have walked across all of Dubois Lake. Other people have paddled in a day. Other people have been windbound on it. You never know what's going to happen. The further north you go, the longer it's going to take for the ice to go out. So when I was doing trips way above the Arctic Circle to start with, we went in late July and August. When I was doing trips that were starting in the tree line and going to the tundra, we could start in early July. Okay. If you look at historical data from some areas, you can get a rough idea, but it's never a guarantee. Be prepared to drag, which I wasn't in 1969. I'd never heard of lining ropes and didn't know how to drag. We could have. So here's another nightmare. We're on Victoria Island. We've paddled the Kujua River. We're paddling seven days on the ocean to get down to the settlement to fly out. Everything is hunky-dory. Went to bed. Next morning, we woke up and all this pack ice belonging to another island about 15 miles away blew in and it stayed there for two days. And so we were dragging on pack ice. So here's my first trip on the tundra, stuck on the ice, didn't have lining ropes, have all my boundary water clothes, don't have rubber boots on. And it wasn't that I'm not ever coming back, it's just that I'm never gonna make this mistake again. So I wrote copious notes on how to do it better. And that really helped on the next trip. Here's that back river trip. We wisely had, this is the time when you always wanted to went to the source. I don't know what it was about going to the source. It was a badge of honor. We got the pilot to drop us on the first lake and dropped all our gear off and came up with a two day supply of food with our tents and sleeping bags. And that was the start of the river at the source. And so we walked down the ice until we could get on the water and then we paddled back to our gear. So the Kanawak River is a fantastic little river. It's, it connects with the Kazan River. It's a, a detour that a lot of the Y camps like to use to avoid one of the big lakes that usually has ice in it. This ice is formed by snow and the snow got blown in. The snowfall is very limited. They have no more water in the Arctic than they have in Arizona, but it doesn't melt most of the time because it's frozen most of the year and there's no sunlight. So this was accumulation of a year or two that built up. And when I've been here before, this ice was maybe knee high. And on this particular trip, they had probably a lot of, of, lot of uh, cool summers, didn't have a lot of melt. And so uh, just a huge ice pack, you paddle between it. Took a trip to the Arctic Ocean to paddle up Chantry Inlet to a, a settlement to start there the next year to leave all of our gear behind. I was making a three year plan where I would have A, B, and C legs. Talked to the wildlife biologist, his name was Jonkel, who was studying bears up here. He said he's never seen ice in August. So on the 11th year, when we showed up, we were iced out and we couldn't go any further. And these are the days before the sat phones. So I paddled back up river to where they usually have a fishing camp that runs for about five weeks. They were closed and I thought that was the safest place to be. And it was, we eventually got a ride out of there. So you saw some of these before, this is the beginning of the hood. So we do portage, we portage waterfalls and major canyons, canyons and that's about it. So in the upper right is the pack boat. Notice there's little flex to it. On the bottom right, I'm on the Nolai River and we're gonna work our way to the Kunwak River. 
and there's a two mile portage between the heights of land and it's very buggy. And so I got all this protective clothing on, just have a t-shirt underneath and also have some protection on my arms or my, my, my hands rather. And then I have uh, a bug net. First on the left, we're on the Hood River. We don't have many, many bugs. It's a nice day. And she has a muskox skull that she wants to bring out. And the rule is, if you want to bring it, you've got to portage it. So contrast that with the portage down here in the Boundary Waters, lightweight Kevlar, not pretty difficult. Just throw it on and away you go. Or some places in tree line, even in the Arctic and tree line, there are no established portages and you might have to bushwhack. We've done that. And then when we went to Hudson Bay, this is what the portages look like. Uh, they've been beaten down for 150 years by the Voyagers. So this is that portage, that two mile portage that you saw me all dressed up in. And this is BJ and she's made the portage and you can see all the black flies crawling all over her pants and that, but she's safe in her head net and she stuck her hands inside her anorak. And it was just a black fly hatch and we happened to catch it. But if you cover up, you're in good shape. So here's an interesting portage. This is going around Wilberforce Falls, which is a three mile walk in the canyons 180 feet deep. And it's all vegetation and you could put this on your shoulders, but the wind might twist you around and you might have problems. So we have these deer drags that they use a harness you use to haul deer out of the woods. We have a D ring on it. We attach it with the carabiners to the ropes on the boat, and we simply walk the boat the three miles. So here's our, some of the ways of paddling. You paddle first. When you can't paddle your line, when you can't line, you walk. When you can't walk, you carry your drag or you lift over. And this is a little lift over. The pack boats are brand new. I didn't I wasn't sure how well they would do on rocks. We might have considered running this today. I probably would, but where you can see how shallow it is. So we're out just lining down and then the guy is ready to jump in on the bow and the stern guy will hop in and away we go. This is going between watersheds and we're going up a shallow stream and it's too shallow to paddle. You can't get a good grip. So we're simply walking up and to top it off, we're celebrated with a rainy day. So we're walking up in the rain that comes and goes as we're working our way up. Going downstream, this is lining and notice the rock garden. You can't paddle through this. But you can maneuver your boat using the ropes. It's a fun game. It's like, it's like playing a board game, except it's got rocks and water. And you simply hop along and take your time. And it saves making three trips. Here's a lift over. You can't do this with a pack boat. Can't put that much weight in a pack boat and lift it up. But hard show boats, it's an easy lift over. That's on the hood. In some rivers, when they braid out, you pick the wrong stream. You can't tell where the most water is going to go. And so you end up in the shallows. And this is the rubber boots. You just hop out and you walk. See the rock on the left is sticking up. The rock in front of the canoe has got a pillow on it. And the person is going to steer that canoe away from the pillow. And the stern guy will pull the back end around. And away you go. Another lining shot running down the rocks. So here's, a, here's a going around the corner. There was a whole stretch of these kind of big waves and we weren't sure if we wanted to do it. And some of the people didn't have a lot of weight water experience on this. So this is a, a three person job. I have a special rope for this. Notice I have a green rope. It's gonna be a hundred feet long and um, it's thinner. My lining rope is attached to my cover and my partner has another long rope. He's got the, the blue life jacket. He's gonna walk down ahead and as this canoe comes out and starts to turn, he's going to give it a tug rather than wait for the current because the current might turn it sideways. We stuck a guy in a notch in case the bow decided to go in a notch, he can push it out. And I'm going to let the canoe get around the corner. Then I'm going to start running down the rocks and letting the rope out and no problem. This particular year, we had a lot of ice on lakes. We couldn't walk the ice because it's black. It'll cave in on us. It's easier to push the ice out of the way than it is to drag the boat over. And you can see my, my homemade uh, skirt there for the bow. This is the same 18 foot canoe you saw on a previous trip. 
here's, we ran out of good water, so we're lining over a ledge. And then I think we had to make maybe a little bit of a drag and then we could get going again. This is the Aerosmith. These are the brand new pack boats. You can see uh, Uktik is Snowy Owl. And it was a clear water river. It was fantastic. And the last night on the trip, we had a big rain and there's a lot of clay and notice the water turned cloudy. And we've just lined down that little rapids and we're now repacking. We're gonna paddle the ocean. This is on the Caribou River. We decided to get in here and uh, the guy didn't walk on, didn't want to walk on the slippery rocks, so he's crawling out over his souvenir antlers. Young, young kid, he's a teenager. This is the only boat I've ever had a problem with. This is the Namara Burnside River. There were three canoes. The third canoe came up in the last rapids. They came down and hit hard. And then the guy said, oh, I've got a lot of water in my boat, so I pulled him over. And the covers were fully on, so I couldn't understand how we got water. And we pulled the packs out and we had cracked about a three foot section of the boat. We only had seven miles to go to get out. So we duct tape it on both sides and put the heavier packs in the other canoes that were basically empty, put the empty barrels in this canoe. And we paddled out and we left it there. We gave it to an Inuit guy who was gonna supposedly repair it. So bugs are part of the North, they're part of the ecosystem, they're part of the food chain. So the key word is adaptation. Everything you do in the Arctic is an adaptation. You make adaptations and you plan ahead of time with the lightweight clothing you want to cover yourself up with, with bug nets, et cetera. You need good tents with bug, bug shelter and maybe a bug shelter to cook in. Wind will always keep the bugs away. And if you see people in the Arctic on a buggy day that has a wind, they all stand in a line. They don't stand in a circle because they all face the wind and all the bugs are on their hat in the back of their head, okay? Very seldom you get bugs out on the water and the bugs love shrubs and brush. So the more, the more wood you have, the brusher you have, the more bugs you have. You'll get a black fly hatch. They love hatching out of fast water, small rapids. And we had a hatch so bad that we actually had to walk down the rapids because we couldn't see the paddle. But it's a short-lived phenomenon. They don't stay forever. These are mosquitoes. They're there all the time. So here's an adaptation for a buggy day for eating your gorp. Here's another adaptation. On this trip, it was a, a small river and we had room for this tent. It's 25 pounds. You only put it on a non-windy day and a windy day it'll blow over, but it's just a real treat for someone to be in there, cook, relax, read, whatever, and not cramped in your tent. Here's another version, not using all the big frame poles, using some, some interlocking poles. This is on the Seal River, worked effectively. So this is up on the Kazan River, and this is at Kazan Falls, and these are guys who belong to the camp called Les Voyagers. They come out of St. Cloud. Originally, it was one high school. Now it's the whole town. It was done by a high school teacher. This is a Dan Cook custom sewing, Cook custom sewing tarp. The red is the ceiling and the whole thing lifts up like you saw in the previous slide. And you've got these seven foot poles, but it's a windy day, but there are bugs. And so these guys took half of it, dropped the other half back to make a windbreak adaptation and shorten their poles. And they're having a nice place to have their evening meal. Notice their canoes in the back, they've got all their packs in them. So the canoes don't blow away. The flag is a Nunavut flag. I give those guys a flag every year they go. Here's another form of bug jacket. For me, they're too hot. I can't handle these, but they work. And so here's, a, here's Kate. She's having her, making her coffee. We're on the Coville River. That little helicopter you see above the word with is actually a mosquito, okay? They just grow them super big in Alaska. And I'm in the background with a different kind of bug net that I'll show you in a few seconds here. So here the guys are on that Kunwalk Kazan Noalai trip in the black fly hatch. And none of them are having problems because the black flies just like to crawl around, but you don't want them in your face. So we all had head nets. One guy had gloves on, um, but you have to prepare for that. So here's me finishing a meal on the Coville. Mine is a mesh. They don't make these anymore. And you, you, you put some DEET on them and the DEET keeps the bugs away. You don't have the DEET on your skin. 
the thing is the bugs are going to be zipping around you making noise which drives some people crazy but they won't bite you because they won't land on you oh well, this is what i look like it works so here we are having tea sitting out on the rock trying to get away from, get a little wind away from some of the bugs and we're just relaxing this is on the uh Hood River on the way to the ocean. Another way to get bug proof. So this is a windy day. So we don't have any bugs, but this guy kept his bug jacket on it for whatever reason, I don't know. And we're reading and we're, we're having downtime and it might be one, two, three hours. Could be to the point that we put our tents up until the wind goes down and it's safe to paddle. But I can measure how good my trip was by how many books I read. If I read all of my books, I had a lot of windy days. If I read almost none of my books, it means we had a perfect trip. So wind also hits your tents. You can see any rocks sometimes to hold them down. And I, my experience is when you're up there for 30 and 40 days a year with all the UV light and all the wind and all the stress, I usually use a tent no more than three years. And then I usually get a new tent. And uh, if tents are too old, uh, wind like this will rip them. So that was Baker Lake and the wind the, the uh, lake on the other side had five and six foot waves. We're on the very north side where the, where the Baker Lake started and the guys on the other side got so stranded they had to send helicopters over to pick them up. This is the Kazan Portage just a mile long. It was a very buggy day. And so we set up two tents, one on each end. Everybody's taking three trips or more. And you take your trip and you jump in a tent and you get out of the bugs. You maybe eat something, you take a snooze and you walk back. And maybe if you have to, you jump on the other tent or you grab your gear and you come back again. Here's a tent in tree line. And here's the lean three. The lean three replaces a tarp. The lean three is, is built on, on the uh, old Baker tent formation in the front. It has bug netting coming down the front. It's got a nice flap that makes a good sunscreen for sitting under. I had an adaptation. I had those red patches sewn on so I could put rocks on. This is the sand. I didn't need them. But if the rocks were braiding against the material on a windy day, they create a hole. Here's a lean two. It's a smaller version. You can see my flaps I had sewn on. Here's my pack boat with a tarp with a heavy pack in it to help protect it from the wind. And there's my tent we're sitting or camp deck is on fall, same place, those less Voyager kids were camped. Notice there's no trees, the tundra. This is Baffin Island, some of the biggest winds I've ever seen in my life. This is out on the ocean. And um, Cabela's made this and they must have sent their designer out to uh, look at all the tents. And they designed a tent that had every feature you ever wanted. And notice the rain fly comes way down to the ground. So you can't have the wind blowing up underneath like some tents do. Took a huge amount of wind, but the frame was able to withstand it. I was absolutely amazed. So we also walked to discover. And when you walk on the land, it's all these little things that are below your feet that you can't see very well. And it's an explosion of color in July and maybe in August and then things dry up and wait for the next year. Some years they'll make a flower and the pollen will go down and the next year they'll make the seed. It's a two year process, but there's a ton of color to be seen in the Arctic. You just have to look for it. You can also find some souvenirs. You can bring these out. You need a permit to bring them out. You have to get them when you get to a settlement. And this one, of course, has the, uh, the racks fall off every year, but this one is attached. So it means probably a wolf or a bear killed it. Or if you're near a settlement, maybe a hunter harvested it. This is up in Alaska on the Colville. As we got near the village, somebody had harvested this and didn't want the bottom of the feet. But that's what their pads look like as they zip across the tundra. And this is the actual caribou. And they have skin growing on the antlers, we call it velvet. It's kind of fluffy. And then when the blood supply gets cut off, they die, the skin dries up, it falls off and they become white. And of course the hair is hollow. So even little teeny caribou can just float across the river because uh, they act like a life preserver. 
And that's where the idea of a hollow fill sleeping bay came from, was from Caribou here. So here's muskox up on, Kuj on uh, Kujua River on Victoria Island. Notice we have snow banks all summer. Part of it looks like you're out in Wyoming or Montana. And there are so many caribou on this island that after a while, you don't even mention it. Or you might tell your bow guy, caribou on the right, caribou on the left another herd, they might look, they might not, you might see a hundred a day or more. On a river like the Thelon, they're a treat and you don't see them that often. Or in some rivers, they only see one or two. And if you get too close, they form this protective herd. This is what they do to protect themselves against wolves. And um, the, the young would go inside that circle. And the idea of the wolves are to get them to come out and charge. So then they can get the herd to disperse and then they can take one down. You can bring some out as souvenirs in some places. Again, you need a permit. But I want to point out, being a biology teacher, notice the eyes are where your ears are. And the eyes are set because these horns are there their entire life, big muscles to hold the head up. So the eyes can rotate rather than turn the head very easily. Wolf tracks. And here's a wolf in the Arctic jumping to get something. Happen to catch it just at the right time. So, so that white wolf. So there are polar bears along the coast. If you're in Hudson Bay, or if you're up on the ocean, um, the other trips there are no polar bears. I only carry a gun when I'm in polar bear territory. This is up on Hudson Bay in the Inuit have killed a, a beluga whale and the polar bear shows up and the polar bear is protected unless Certain settlements have a permit to kill some, but if their permits have been used up, then it's again protected. And it wasn't very hungry. It only took a few bites and it walked on. Wonderful animals. They're gonna be threatened now with climate change. This is a grizzly on the Noatak River. This is right in front of our camp. This mother walked into our camp. There's a little stream between us and the, and the rest of the shore. And she caught five salmon. And she ran around the water. It was amazing to watch this. She fed her three young, and we're no more than 25, 30 feet away, and she totally ignored us. And this is why bears are dangerous. And what we would call fingernails, they have these claws that grow out from that area, and they dig, and they'll dig six, six out, and they can dig other small animals out, and they can rip pieces of flesh off of caribou, et cetera. You wouldn't want them to rake your face. This is sick sick. It's the ground squirrel. It hibernates for nine months. It runs its body temperature right down to near freezing. And then they come out and they feed on all these grass seeds like this guy is doing. So I've had lots of ice experiences on both Hudson Bay and the Arctic Ocean. And this is on Hudson Bay. We paddled it one summer and we had a lot of these floating pieces. And we also have beluga whales, which are not ice, but they're curious. They'll come and swim next to you and they'll, they'll swim under your canoe. And they're fun to watch, they're about 15 feet long. Seals that like to lay out on the ice and get sunned, and when, that's not a danger with, for, for them with no polar bears being here because they would have to sneak up on them. Pretty hard to do when they're on an ice floe. Sandhill cranes, they start in Texas and they go way to the far Arctic, way up on the Arctic islands. And they nest along the way if they find a place they like. So they're nesting anywhere from <clears throat> um, Texas all the way to the Arctic. We have a lot of them nesting in Minnesota, Wisconsin. Rough-legged hawks, they have a beak that can, can uh, basically tear flesh because they have to kill small birds or small mammals, or if they find a, a dead animal on, on land, they can live off of it. Peregrine falcons, they also have a piercing beak. And in the 1970s, they were so rare because of DDT contamination. They were only found in Alaska in parts of the far north. And every nest we came across, we had to document and turn it into the Canadian Wildlife Service. Today, that's not an issue. We have them growing all over the place in, uh, in the United States. A ptarmigan, they turn white in the winter. They turn brown in the summer. This is August. This one's starting to turn white. Notice it has feathers on his feet. Helps him in the winter time. So Ogden Nash, a um, poet wrote, the ptarmigan, a kind of grouse, lives in the Arctic with its spouse. 
the tarmac is smart and perky and tastes much better than a turkey. Here's willow ptarmigan. You find these in the mountains and also out west. And you have the owl pellets, which are left when uh, they regurgitate this from their gullet. Bird nest. <clears throat> you know what people have lived in there forever up in the far north? There were four major waves over thousands of years. They came from Asia and went all the way to Greenland. And the last big wave was the Dorset culture. And they use rocks. These are nookshooks. It means something like a man. They indicate where to travel or where important places. They also made igloos in the winter and tent rings in the summer. And they would make a skin tent and support it with either wood that they picked up from coming down a river or they would use the big ribs of some of the whales. Open grave, this is pre-Christian times, open grave. And this would be when the missionaries came. And here's one that you know the missionaries came because of the cross. Missionaries came around uh, 1910, 15 or so in that part of the world. So the Inuit in the um, Central Arctic had access to wood because it came down to rivers because the river started in, in a tree line. And they carved their, their utensils out of that. When they came across trappers and, and later on in the 30s, 40s, they got tin cups where they made them out of tin cans. And you can see where they've taken pieces of metal and they've made scrapers for working on hides. Here's an ulu, that's a woman's knife, and it's made out of a saw blade. So I was spent some time on Hudson Bay in, um, in the late 70s, and I went out to a place called Nita Point where the Inuit would have lived for 2000 consecutive years, National Geographic did the research. While I was there, they, they harvested 21 seals, a baby walrus, in three beluga whales. And here they're cutting them up. And this is their food supply. And here they've taken a seal and they've, they've skinned it and they've, they've, they've sewn out the places where air might escape. You blow air into it and it makes a float when they harpoon a whale. You know what people, this is the clothing they would wear traditionally in the winter. Today, they're probably wearing down, but it's made out of caribou hide. And here's a carver. They used to work with a, uh, a saw, a file, and an ax. Today, they're working with Dremel tools. Here's a guy uh, doing a, showing a typical shaman from the old days. But notice the goggles are made out of a piece of bone with a slit to prevent snow blindness. They started doing Inuit art in the late 60s, and I started collecting it. And I'm still a collector of Inuit art. So the Inukshuk is synonymous with Inuit people, and that's why they put that on their flag for Nunavut. Here's some few travel highlights. A glacial erratic by Dubois Lake that fell out of the glacier and it was first noted in the 1850s by Terrell. Here's Kazan Falls, spectacular place. I've been there seven times. You can't see it from the campsite. After you make the portage, you have to paddle across the river and hike back up. Wilberfer Falls, 180 foot drop, the first 90 feet and in the, in the pool you see and then it drops the next 90 feet. Fantastic place. Fishing is good. Trout, grayling, and Arctic char are the only species, none of the other species we have here. Here's a great eating size lake trout. And here's a nice grayling with this big sail, dorsal fin, which makes it pull like crazy. Notice a little spinner is caught on. And here are the Arctic char that we got at the end of the Hood River. We caught all these in 45 minutes. We are leaving the next day. There was ice on shore. We cut the heads off. We gutted them, packed them on our blue barrels, packed them with ice, and took them back to Yellowknife. Here's a chum from the uh, Noatak River. Here's our portable kitchen. Here's the best thing I've ever done. It's my tundra shower. It works extremely well. Doesn't take much water. You stay very clean. And my original battery for my CPAP was a motorcycle battery. And today I have three lithiums. Each one will last a day and they're the size of a paperback. And this is how we charge them as we go. Today, we have waterproof cameras. When I started out, we didn't. We had big, big uh, cases to put our cameras in. Take notes every night. This is on the Aerosmith. Going across Finland, I brought my iPad and a little keypad and put in a waterproof case and type notes every night. You can see my old CPAP machine there in my tent. And this is a transponder. This is the first thing we had before we got sat phones. 
and today we have in reaches that we can we can contact people from the outside. To the Owl River, government regulations, you had to sleep in this enclosure at the end of the river. There are no polar bears there. This is made for the spring when they're doing polar bear research, but a rule is a rule. I called it my jail. I couldn't sleep outside. Midnight sun, this is about as dark as it gets and not in the height of the, of the 24 hour daylight. And then this is August and that's our October in the Arctic. And in the latest I've ever paddled any trip was Thanksgiving and the Boundary Waters, which was an amazing experience. It doesn't happen very often. So I've been in the Canadian Arctic for 40 years. I love it. It was all north, all of it was Northwest Territories. Now it's Nunavut in Northwest Territories. And big area, and you dream and you look and you look at rivers and you do discovery. And here are my trips, uh, the Central Canadian Arctic. Some of the trips, I've, rivers I've been on two times, one I've been on five times, and they're wonderful. So in, very, in summary, checklists always work. Always take clean and working gear. It doesn't have to be brand new. Test everything out to make sure the rain will not get in. That means put the hose on your tent and your tarp. We can paddle all day in the lake, and believe it or not, people forget to drink, and they actually have hydration problems. Remember to have fun. And we do that sometimes. We bring a kite just for the fun of it. And here's a kite with a GoPro on it. And that's the Noatak River. And here's our camp. And um, we're now in tree line and we're just about ready to hit the ocean. Here's my pack boats with my famous floorboard and the flag we made for the Aerosmith River on our first descent. So I took this off of my. Um, my Nordic ski team, we have a, a saying every year on our shirts. One of my athletes did this, and I really like it. He says, have a dream, and you want, always want to have a dream, but you have to live it. And to live it, you have to set a goal to achieve it. So live it and achieve it. Those are your two things. So it, we're, I think we ran out of time. So I have a, an expedition planner. I'm doing that program on later on Sunday. But if you would like a copy of my expedition planner, and for Alaskan River informations, you can send me an email, Bob's Canoe, one word, B O B S C A N O E, at Comcast.net. Be sure to get the net. Okay. So it's been a pleasure doing this. Don't know if anybody saw it, but I certainly had a lot of fun. Thank you so much, Bob. It doesn't look like we have any questions come through quite yet, but I'm just going to give people, there are people watching, so I'm just going to give them a minute or two to see if that's they have super. any questions that's super it was a fun experience i enjoyed your helping me set this all up i'll be better prepared for the next two <laughs> <laughs> definitely yeah and a friday afternoon or a thursday afternoon rather i don't know if if how many people are free or how many far north paddlers aren't doing something else but it is what it is so i rushed it but that's okay Yeah, it's definitely, it's hard to fit into an hour. I would imagine you could talk for a long time about this. Stuff. Well, I'm used to a longer program and I didn't want to cut it down. Totally. But my Boundary Water program is probably half the number of slides. And I expect there I might get some comments and it's on a Saturday. So we'll, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. Yeah, it's just, there's a little bit of a lag sending it out to the public so they're still like finishing watching your presentation and so that's oh, why we can sit here for a moment and see if anyone has questions at the end yeah because on my watch i'm coming up to three o'clock <laughs> yep exactly <laughs> so you're ready to go to the next one. Oh, here we go okay so let me unmute up here um our first question is when do you when you do your alaska trips do you store gear that doesn't come on the river? Um, normally we, we, we might, but the only way it doesn't come on the river is what you wear on the plane and that'd be shorts and a t-shirt. So that's not a big deal. So I don't, but you could store gear at, at wherever you get your plane. We've done that before. Yes, they'll take your gear. Great. Um, yeah, we'll see if anyone else has questions.
Hey, we had one person who watched. That's good. Yep. <laughs> More than that, Bob. Don't worry. <laughs> well, don't, whatever. <laughs> All righty. I haven't seen any other questions come up, so I think we'll close off there. And okay. uh, I really, I want to say thank you, Bob, for taking the time to do this today. It was really interesting. It was fun. And I hope you get to the far north. Yes, definitely. <laughs> uh, thanks, everyone, for watching uh, Midwest Mountaineering Outdoor, our, this presentation through our Outdoor Adventure Expo. And um, feel free to visit our YouTube page. I'll put that in the chat for any past um, presentations that we've had this week. And um, keep coming back to the Outdoor Adventure Expo website for our future presentations. Thanks.